manager, uh, meat lab manager, when I was going to school at, in Laramie. And I think I'm just really proud of how far they've come and what their story is. And I'm just really excited to, to let Kelsey and McKenna tell their story. And, and uh, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to them. This is Kelsey with 307 Meat Company. Thanks, Chance. Can everybody hear me? Uh, so, for those of you that don't know me, as Chance said, I'm Kelsey with 307 Meat Company. I'll give you a little background on my story. Um, <clears throat> my days in meat processing began probably when I was about four years old. Uh, my grandfather and my dad had a meat packing plant in Dayton, Wyoming. Uh, I have this uh, Polaroid picture of sitting in the middle of a gut pile, uh, playing with the gut pile when I was four. Um, my mom prefers not to watch that. Uh, I remember when I was a little kid that my dad took a baby calf out of a cow that he had butchered and we put it in the jar and we put it in mom's fridge and she lost it when she came home that day. Uh, so anyhow, uh, my grandfather and my dad sold the plant um, when I was young and my dad did a lot of road construction and coal mining. Um, I grew up in the in Wright in the coal mining business, went to college, um, had raised some livestock, went to college and decided I was going to be a veterinarian, as about 90% of students do when they go to animal science. Um, got to my junior year, organic chemistry. I passed it with a C, but I realized that uh, chemistry and I don't get along, and I want to work on large animals. I don't want to work on small animals, and that is not a very profitable profession. So I changed my focus to business and animal science, uh, during my time in the university there, I spent uh, four and a half or four years working in the meat laboratory. Uh, Dr. Hickson, when I graduated, said, give me your resume. And I said, for what? And he says, for a job. And I said, for what? And he goes, you'll find out. And so <clears throat> I went to work for a stock show and worked for a stock show right after I graduated. Um, got a phone call, went up and interviewed back in Laramie at a bank become an ag lender and a commercial lender. In about two years of that, 2008 hit, I was managing about $40 million in loans. Um, two years out of college, got to be a little overwhelming at that time. Uh, when I interviewed for that job, they asked me what my five-year goal was. My five-year goal was not to work for them. They still hired me though. <laughs> um, my five-year goal was to own my own packing plant. Um, and then 2008 hit, wasn't good, the bank wasn't doing well. The meat lab job, the manager of the meat lab job came back open at the university and I applied um, and, and got it. I, they asked me what my five-year goal was and I said not to work for them. They still hired me. So um, anyhow, it took a little bit more than five years but I do have my own meat packing plant now. Uh, so about 2016, 2015, 2016, uh, phone just does not stop at the meat lab. McKenna can tell you about the phone. The phone's the death of us. Um, but anyhow, it just wouldn't stop. Everybody's like, can we process a beef there? Can we process a beef there? Nobody has any space. Nobody has any space. And the university and Dr. Means had a very strict policy that we don't do work for outside people. The university's there for teaching, research, and extension purposes, not for private business. And so we, we didn't ever did really get into that um, unless the state called and we did a couple for them. But uh, <clears throat> I started looking into, you know, really putting my head down and putting my work to start a meatpacking plant. How much space do I need? Mm -hmm. How big should it be? Where should it be located? Um, I started, uh, my business plan, got through a lot of my business plan, got a phone call from my attorney. My attorney at that time was just a friend. Uh, she goes, what's this? I hear you're trying to sell parts of your company. I said, well, yeah, I'm trying to raise capital. She goes, you gotta stop, man. I said, what do you mean? She goes, you have to like file stuff with the US government, with the SEC, like you have to get all this stuff done. You can't just go sell your company without having this stuff filed. Oh man, so. I went back, told my wife, I said, we're not doing this. I said, there's no way that I'm gonna do this. I was over my head. And she found me a different attorney that helped me out. We mortgaged both of our houses to the extent we could um, to 
depleted everything we had in our bank account to just pay the attorney. Um, we spent a lot of money on the attorney. But anyhow, we raised some capital. Now, I don't own all of it. I own a majority share of it, uh, a little bit over a majority share of it. Um, we sat down, I hired an architect. I drew out my plans on a piece of paper, 5,000 times maybe, um, up till two or three o'clock in the morning, drawing this plan out and uh, sent it to the architect. We started going down the road. We got 70% drawings, had a contractor. We discussed the budget. What I call D-Day came, and that was the day that the bank, my loan approval was due. I either had to sign the papers or we had to go through the whole loan approval process again. And we got to that day, and my contractor sent me the budget. It was a million dollars more than what I had budgeted. And uh, so I was pretty heartbroken at that point. I you know, came home with my wife and I said, man, we've spent all this money and it's not gonna happen. There's no way the bank's gonna give me another million bucks. No way. I'm already asking for millions as it was. There's just no way. And I went to Association of Meat Processors, um, annual convention for the National Convention, and some of my friends out there like, just put your head down, you can do it. Refocus, get it done. And so we did it, we redesigned the plant, we shrunk it down about 3,000 square feet. I went back to the table, started raising more money, raised some more money, uh, went to the back to the bank, and uh, we got it done. Got a loan approval, hired a different contractor, um, and we went to building. I sat down to the contractor and he's like, so we got a year to do this? And I said, nope, you got nine months. Nine months, yeah. I said, I need to be operational, we need to get going. And uh, I said, I have a lot of people's money in my bank account and we need to get it spent. We need to get a plant on the, on the ground. So in May of 2019, we started construction. We broke ground on the plant um, and they finished the plant and turned it over to me on February 28th of 2020. We were 17 days behind our deadline um, which is okay, those things happened. We had a ton of wind, and we about killed somebody with a sheet of tin trying to side the building, and we got it done. We went to hire people. Um, that time I had a production manager hired. We hired uh, four more guys to start working for us, and we started off. Uh, March 3rd was our, or March 6th was our first slaughter day, I think. March 6th was our first slaughter. March 4th. March 4th was our first slaughter day of 2020. Um, we put the first beef down. We only had one beef the first day. Put it down, went to town. Came back the next day, I had scheduled four beef. And it took us 10 and a half hours to do four beef. And I'm like, what is wrong? With the meat lab, four guys and I, we could do, I don't know, nine, 10 beef before lunch for research. And research at the university is slow. So uh, I was like, what is going on? And uh, I had some trouble at the beginning. So <clears throat> I was a little stressed out, overwhelmed at the beginning. Uh, we made it through those couple weeks and then COVID hit. Um, COVID to this day, I can tell you, has probably been a blessing in disguise for my business. Um, but at the beginning it was rough. People did not want to leave their job to come to work for me. Um, Nobody was working. I had, I don't know how many people turn us down because they were making more on unemployment than what I was willing to pay them. Um, one lady was making double on unemployment than what I could afford to pay her at that time. Um, and so the first, first couple of months were pretty rough. Um, people got to work. Um, my guys did not have any training when we started. Uh, we got it done. We, they taught them. Um, the kid I had hired, Jace, he was my production manager. He's a good kid. He taught those guys well, you know, and we got rolling. The phone, though, I was like, I can do this. I can manage the phone. I can manage marketing. I can run the retail store. I can run the plant. I can do it all, right? Yeah, no way. No way. Uh, it was probably sometime in late April, first part of May, and I came into the plant, looked at my phone that was sitting on my desk, and uh, 
there were 72 voicemails from the time I left at five o'clock the night before to the next morning. And I was like, I gotta take this thing out of my office. I took it to the retail, retail store. We opened the retail store April 9th. And the guy in the retail store, my manager out there, he's like, I can't do this either. This is crazy. Still to this day, we can ask McKenna, but the phone does not stop. She stopped, she asked me for a day off, went to the mountains, she transferred the phone to my cell phone. <laughs> And my phone was going berserk, just going and going and going. And I called her up, I said, I don't know where you're at, but you gotta find a computer and you gotta transfer this phone to somebody else because I can't run this place and answer this phone. So, um, so that's kind of the story. We went from one animal at the beginning, right now we're slaughtering 32 animals a week. Um, McKenna has pushed us to 40 by about the end of February. Um, and we're going to head into 40, I'm 40 beef a week. Um, so it's pretty incredible the need that was out there. We went from nothing in our community to uh, 40 plus. Uh, McKenna tells me we have about 3,000 beef on a waiting list for 2021. Our 2021 book is completely full at this point, and there's that many on the waiting list. So some days when we have a cancellation, we just start at the top, and the first guy that answers the phone and can get them here in the next five hours, gets a spot. Um, so that, that's kind of my story. Um, my plant's about 9,000 square feet. If you're familiar with Wyoming Custom Meats down the road, it's about the same uh, size at this point with his expansion down there. Um, I employ 25 people at this point, at the, right now. Um, some of those are full-time, most of those are full-time, some of those are part-time. I have a cleaning crew that comes in at 3.30 in the afternoon and cleans till 8 o'clock at night, and it's all women. Uh, and they do a fabulous job, way better than any man can do. Um, so uh, I have six cutters. Well, I have five cutters on the table right now, six cutter coming next week. We have four people in, in the packaging line. Um, we have two people right now in specialty products. We have four guys on the slaughter floor, um, and it's, it's rocking and rolling. Um, so I thought I would tell you that story, and then maybe talk a little bit about marketing meat. Well, when I started at the Meat Lab in 2008, uh, direct marketing of meat really wasn't a thing in Wyoming, okay? Uh, it's, you go to the grocery store, you buy meat, where'd it come from? Nobody knew. Um, it came from one of the big four packers, where it came from. Where it originated from there, we don't know. Um, it's changed over the time, and direct marketing in 2008 in the East Coast was starting to become a pretty big thing. Uh, they did a lot of direct marketing, but those places out there have 40, 50 head of cattle, and they were direct marketing um, to their customers, either online or you know, to the direct to the consumer, farmers markets, those type of things. Over the course of the next four to six years, we saw that move across the country a little bit. Internet sales became a thing. Uh, and then we developed our own brand at the university. We developed cowboy branded meats and the snack sticks and summer sausage that, we, that they market now um, that I developed. Um, that became huge. We were running uh, five to 600 pounds of summer sausage every couple of weeks and thousands of snack sticks. Um, and so it kind of, that kind of took, took hold in Wyoming. A company called Wyoming Pure Natural is in Wheatland. They started, Cindy Gertz, she started direct marketing um, in that 2010 type uh, time frame, And it's just grown since then. Now, it's pretty incredible how many people want to direct market. Some of that has been spurred on by COVID and the collapse of our food system during COVID by the pig packers. Um, was it, in my opinion, was it bound to happen? It was bound to happen. Uh, for those of you that don't know, a big packer like Cargill Tyson, JBS, uh, National Beef, those facilities on average process somewhere between four and 8,000 head of beef a day. Um, they're massive factories. Um, they're very efficient at what they do. And that's how they can produce meat very cheaply and get it to the supermarket. 
Most big packers don't make any money on meat. They make all their money on what they call the drop, selling on hearts, livers, tongues, tails, and hides. However, that's a little challenging now. Hides are worth absolutely zero in this country. <clears throat> when I started in 2008, um, Jared, one of my custom mates and I were talking, we're selling beef hides for 65 bucks a hide. Today, I take every hide to the landfill and I pay the landfill $60 to throw it away. Um, and so that has changed. And so that's changed in how we do business too, as far as our marketing goes. Uh, most of my customers right now are direct marketers. I'd say 50%, 60%. Of our customers are direct marketers they are direct marketing either on online or directly to the consumer uh, most consumers now want to know where their products coming from they want to know who produced it who cut it uh, and I think it's important for everybody to know that I'm not having anything against the big packers there's still a place for them uh, and there's still meat that can be sold at Walmart that I can't produce cheap enough for that consumer and I, we have a special thing going on in the United States that we can produce meat for a cheap enough price that low-income people can actually purchase it that's not the case the rest of across the rest of the world um, but we can do it here we have people that have the disposable income here to be able to buy uh, direct from our producers so uh, with that I guess if McKenna wants to come up uh, we'll talk a little bit about what I think it is to be a meat company, okay? Who in here direct markets meat currently? Okay. Do you, how do you sell your meat? Facebook. Facebook, okay. So if I buy meat from you, tell me the transaction that's gonna happen. I list it, somebody gives me a call or sends me a private message and then. Okay, what, am I buying just a steak or am I buying a quarter of beef? I'm buying a quarter, half, or whole. Okay. Okay, are you paying for the processing or am I paying for the processing? We are. You are, you're rare. A lot of people right now, well I shouldn't say that, about half of our customers are still selling cattle, okay? In your instance, you're right on the verge of either selling meat, in my opinion, or selling cattle, okay? A lot of customers, a lot of our people want a direct market, they're selling the animal on the hoof based on the carcass weight, or either on the hoof or on the car suite, and then the customer's paying for the processing. So in my opinion, you're not a meat business. You're still a cattle rancher that's selling cattle. They're saying paying for the processing or either you're paying for the processing. I believe that if you want to direct market cattle, hogs, lambs, sell meat, okay? The consumer gets very confused when they pay you $3 a pound for me, for their your animal on the rail, and then they go to the grocery store and they see that it's something sixteen ninety nine a pound. They have a tough time can relating that. I would encourage you if you're going to start marketing meat and direct direct to the consumer that you sell meat. That means that you take it to the butcher, you pick the cut sheet, and you sell the meat for on the meat price, right? So you sell a steak. Ribeye steak, you sell it for $18.99 a pound, $21.99 a pound. It doesn't matter. That's up to you. Um, that's where we see a lot of struggles with the customers that we are um, dealing with, is that they don't understand why um, customers coming to them and going, I'm paying $1,600 or $1,800 for half a beef. How does that relate to what I could buy in the grocery store? Um, what's this top round steak? I have no clue what a top round steak is. What's a chuck steak? I have no clue because I don't see that in the grocery store. So the next thing I would tell you is you need to become educated about what meat is, okay? What is a chuck eye steak? Does anybody know what a terrace major is in the room? So a terrace major is called a petite tender. It comes out of the chuck. Lays just against the blade bone and the chuck. It's about the size of two cigars. It might be the most phenomenal piece of meat on the place, on the face of this earth. It's absolutely wonderful. If you've ate it all garden and had the steak 
in the pasta, that's what it is. Olive Garden purchases a ton of that in the market today. You'll never find it in the grocery store. What about a Merlot steak? Anybody know where the Merlot is or what it is? Well, it's been ground beef in every one of your houses. It's a muscle that lays in the heel of the back leg of the animal, and it is absolutely phenomenal. It is another one of those that is very, very tender. However, you're never gonna find it in the grocery store because it takes a big packer way too long to take it out. It takes us a long time to take it out. But that's where we have the advantage in direct marketing is that we can have these things cut, the value added cuts made by our butcher and be able to market those. Um, that'll bring your customer back because they're gonna eat that and they're going to say that was phenomenal. I've never had that anywhere else. And the only reason they had it is because you can direct market and you can go to the butcher and say, I want these cuts. Um, let's see, one other, quite, one other thing that we have on direct marketing, um, a lot of butchers and still to this day, still cut a bone in chuck. That is the worst, worst way to cut a chuck uh, in my opinion. A bone in chuck has so many different muscles. They run so many different ways and each one of those muscles is gonna have a different eating experience. In order for you to capitalize on your animal and to get somebody to come back and buy the next time, you need to create a consistent eating experience. And if you have a big old chuck steak out there and they slap it down and the one guy eats this muscle and one guy eats this muscle, it might be good over here and it might be horrible over here. So a lot of people have criticized me, why do you want to limit the eating experience? We want to highlight the eating experience. Well, that's what we're doing by limiting it, is coming down to the, a single muscle or two muscles to uh, limit that eating experience so it is phenomenal and it's not one piece is chewy and one piece is good. Um, let's see, I think of some other things about marketing that we've seen. Um, I'll let McKenna talk a little bit about what we do from our actual marketing at 307 uh, as far as getting our customers in the door and getting our name out there. Hey everybody, so if you don't know, my name is McKenna Greenwald and I don't know why, but Kelsey trusted to hand his website and social media over to me um, about a year ago to the day. I'm still actually in my undergrad at the University of Wyoming. I'm studying ag business and marketing, so it was a really exciting opportunity. I've always been interested in the meat industry. I started, I actually have known Kelsey for a really long time. Um, when I was in 4-H, I uh, meets judged in his facility and um, the love just kind of began there and here we are now. So it's been a tremendous opportunity. Obviously I came on last year about this time. Um, we started promoting the business as we were building the facility, which is really unique. We see a lot of plants right now that are being converted from like an old conditioning factory or some other type of business. They convert it into a facility and Kelsey obviously built his from the ground up. Um, so we wanted to highlight that um, it's kind of been a grassroots campaign, I would say, in the beginning. We didn't have a lot of extra money. Um, Kelsey kind of went into that earlier. So I just got on social media and I kept sharing our story. Um, we can drive about an hour away and shake hands with the rancher that provides us meat, which is obviously kind of the same opportunity that you guys have to share your story. So I saw that the Laramie community really liked to hear about Kelsey's family being a small business. Um, highlighting all of our producers. We have a Wyoming raised product. Um, we sell only Berkshire pork. Um, that's an awesome, if you haven't had a Berkshire pork chop, I highly recommend. Also, if you're ever in Laramie, you gotta stop and try Kelsey's bacon. But the products are certainly not that hard to sell. When you finally get them into someone's hands, they're gonna wanna come back for more. Um, so that's kind of what we've been trying to highlight. Recently, we've been able to do more promoting. Um, on social media, we get a lot of hits from that and people come into our shop from the community. Um, we still have a lot of room to grow, even in just Laramie. We still meet people on the street who have no idea that our facility is out there. So I'm still learning in my position. And Kelsey and I have talks about um, every other day, probably different things that we can do um, to share our story with people. 
Um, just from highlighting our all-woman cleaning team that work at our facility that's pretty unique um, to everything else that goes on there. It's been really fun. I would say that um, getting people to know our brand has been the most exciting part of that. And each one of you have kind of the same exact story to tell. So I would encourage you to um, take advantage of that. You guys have pride in your cattle and then you can go ahead and sell that meat. Um, new laws in Wyoming are allowing this and if you guys are able to, it'd be nice to bring your animals into our facility and we could cut you some value added products that you can promote as well. Um, that's kind of my little spiel that we've been going on. What else have you been doing with marketing, Kelsey? Yeah, uh, I guess that's, if you're gonna get in, even in the cattle, did you have a question? I was just gonna ask, what's the significance, you guys are USDA's inspected facility, right? Sure, yeah, you told me to talk about that earlier. I'm sorry. Yeah, uh, so go back to 2008, uh, <clears throat> there was no USDA inspected facility in the state of Wyoming at that point. Um, I'm not sure when they started. Wyoming Authentic Products is in Cody. They make snack sticks and jerky products. Um, they got a grant from the state to put that facility in. They started marketing it. That was USDA inspected. Now, um, I'd have to think, lost track. There's quite a few. There's one that's starting next month in Sheridan. Um, the Torrington plant that was shut down by USDA is now back as a USDA facility, inspected facility. Um, Wyoming Custom Meats, which is now Frank's Butcher Shop, um, went USDA a little over a week and a half ago. Uh, there's a, two plants in Jackson that are USDA. Um, one's a slaughter facility and one's a cooked products facility. Um, and there's a couple other that are being talked about. The significance of being USDA allows us to market and sell our product across state lines. For me, that was probably a must. Uh, right now, 40% of our business on the custom side, uh, cutting side comes out of Colorado. Uh, so we needed that down there. Um, but if you really wanna get into the meat processing business and start marketing, you can't ship your stuff across state lines if it's state inspected um, and ship it to that guy in New York City. So having a USDA inspected facility is kind of key to getting that done. Uh, what does that involve? It involves um, writing a food safety plan and submitting it to the USDA and then staying on the phone every day saying where's my approval um, because just like the state of Wyoming and the Wyoming Department of Ag, in our facility, labor is very hard to come by. Um, extremely hard to come by. Right now, USDA is experimenting going to a model in which the plant in the big packers, the plant actually does all their inspection and they'll go to one inspector in the big plant that just verifies some things. And the reason they're doing that is because the USDA cannot entice enough people to come to work for them to be inspectors. Uh, just like we struggle on a daily basis trying to get people to come in and work. Um, USDA has that same problem which baffles me because they have excellent benefits. Um, the pay is really good. And if you're in a facility like mine or Jared's, you don't have to work very hard at all. Specifically that my inspector watches TV for six hours a day. So, um, yeah, so that's the significance of being USDA is it's just a, a level of inspection that allows you to ship your product across state lines or internationally. Um, we potentially might be gonna look for an international certificate from USDA so we can ship to Taiwan because the state is very big about going to Taiwan. So we have some customers that wanna do that. And that's kind of the, that, uh, the significance of being USDA. When you become USDA though, the phone rings off the hook because people want those services. Um, we don't pay for that inspection. It's 40 hours a week that we don't pay for. If we go over, then we start paying overtime to the federal government for that at a rate of about $68 an hour. Um, unless we work a holiday and then it goes to $97 an hour. Um, or if we do bison, it's 68 bucks an hour as well. So 
Um, back to the marketing side of it, if you're gonna market direct market, um, we found, and I think that this, a lot of companies, whether they're meat companies or um, a chiropractor, um, that social media has probably become the biggest and easiest way to market. Um, you can hit so many people in such, amount of, in such a short amount of time with little money, uh, it's pretty powerful. My retail manager, he's like, we need to do something different. Uh, he gets paid commission, obviously, but he's like, we gotta do something different. We gotta do some radio ads. And so we looked into radio ads and for four ads a day, five days a week, for a year was $16,000. And uh, right now we spend uh, a little over 300 a month on social media and the amount of people that we can get in front of uh, impressions that we can get is way more than what we could get for that, that same amount of money on radio. So uh, I would suggest doing social media. Find somebody very smart with social media, young. McKenna is way smarter than I am. She's like, oh yeah, we just gotta do this, 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 that. Yeah. And yeah, we have quite a following now on social media. Uh, we have people that drive out of Denver out of Fort Collins to come up uh, and just do their shopping uh, for our meat out of Cheyenne. Um, but it's still, we have this people that are like on the phone, where are you guys located? Right by the highway department. Where's that? It's like, you guys drive down 287 every day. But you, um, so it still baffles me about how to find and how to connect with people um, in our own community, but we have people all across the country that know about us. So, uh, I guess at that point, I'll just leave it open to some questions. Um, I'm not much of a planned speaker. I, I, McKenna's like, what are we gonna talk about? I'm like, we're just gonna wing it. Um, I'll tell my story. So that's kind of my story. So I'll take some questions. McKenna, she can tell you a little bit more, or she can answer the questions about um, customers and uh, marketing. Questions? So can you guys balance out what you do custom for people and what you can do for your, your retail side of it? Yeah, that's a good question. So <clears throat> a lot of criticism, McKenna's fiance and his parents, I approached as investors in the beginning and they're like, I want you to put it in Torrington. And I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna get my wife to move to Torrington, Wyoming. She works for the university, she's not moving there, right? So why did I put it in Laramie? One reason was my approach to this business was that I didn't want to own any meat. That was my original goal, was never to own an ounce of meat. My intention was to build a plant that would process for people in Wyoming, right? You have the story, you have the cattle, I don't have a story, I'm just a butcher, right? I can whack it up on a saw, okay? So that was my intention. And then when I started doing my business planning and looking at where, what I wanted to do, I had people approach me from Casper. I had people from Wheatland. Um, we have people that drive every month from Jackson Hole and bring us cattle. And so what's, where's the right spot, right? So then I decided, well, maybe Laramie's the right spot because one, we have students. Wait, we did have students. We don't have many students now. We had students, and I thought, that's a great workforce opportunity, right? And so uh, we're on I-80, so if we start shipping, we can do that. Uh, so that's why I put it in Laramie. That's, my intention was not to work, not to slaughter feed cattle every day. My intention was completely to help producers that want to direct market their products have a facility that's dedicated to do that. Um, and so then I thought, well, if we're gonna do that, I wanna highlight some of our shareholders and some of the awesome meat that comes through our facility. And so I said, well, let's put a retail store on it. We put the retail store on, um, and that was, in my business plan, gonna be 25% of our business. Um, where that stands right now is not 25%, I can tell you that. Um, it's probably lower than that. 
so right now what we do is I reserve two days, two days a month. Um, one day is just kind of blank right now um, to if I need to uh, slaughter some extra stuff for custom, for like halves or holes, quarters, those type of things. The other day is completely for my beef or my hogs to put in the retail store. So I don't reserve a whole lot for myself. Uh, majority of it is all what you want to call custom. Um, and what we do that a lot of packers don't do is we offer a custom label for every one of our customers. So if they want to choose to do that, give us a logo. We'll make a label in about 10 minutes, 15 minutes. We'll put it on your package. It has nothing to do with us on it. Um, every bit of information is our customers besides the inspection legend. Other questions? No questions. So you mentioned you've got kind of wait list of about 2,000 animals in that month. And that tells me that there's quite a need for this for the rest of the state. Do you call facilities like yours in the state to be able to handle it? Good question. So last year, uh, the Wyoming Business Council spent some money and contracted to have a feasibility study done. That feasibility study reported that the state of Wyoming was currently harvesting about 5,000 head of beef a year with a capacity of almost 26,000, 27,000, okay? So there's a capacity there, 21,000 head of beef that could be slaughtered with current operational plants current operational plants. So then what's the problem, right? We, got a pro we have a capacity to do it. What's the problem? The problem is labor. It's purely labor, right? If I could put it on the people, which have grown it, and surprisingly, we have a lot of people that have stayed, <clears throat> but I can't pay $30 an hour, right? You can go work for the oil field and make $30 an hour. You go to the coal mine at a high school and make $20 an hour, right? I start you out at $12 an hour with no experience. I don't see anything from you for about four to six weeks, really. I don't see any increased production for four to six weeks. So that's the problem is labor. The big companies have driven that in my opinion. Uh, ag does it to ourselves. We've done it to ourselves for years. We've been a price taker and not a price dictator. Um, we've hired people at eight bucks an hour uh, to run our tractors to swath at 10 bucks an hour instead of paying competitive wages like the rest of the country has done. And why is that? Because we can't compete with JBS. Today, I can't compete with JBS, right? They make zero dollars on the meat. They make all their money on the drop. And what do I do with the drop? I spend a hundred bucks on every animal putting it in the landfill because I have no opportunity to sell it. I don't produce enough of the drop to create pallet loads to ship. I don't produce enough hides to have a big hide buyer come to me. So I lose all that. Um, so that's where the capacity, that's where it's coming from, right? I believe it's a lot of labor problems um, that we can't get people to work because they don't wanna work for that money, which I don't disagree. And two, it hasn't been a sexy job, right? Everybody wants to go to college. Everybody pushes people to go to college. Don't get me wrong, I have a college degree, and I'm grateful for it. But we push people to go to college and not go into the trades, whether it be an electrician, a plumber, a welder, a butcher, right? And so it hasn't been a sexy position. Um, and yeah, I, there's more plants coming, right? How far it goes, I don't know. Um, I worry, I uh, worry about my facility, I worry about other facilities. How long can we sustain this? Um, how many plants can come on board before we're back to uh, the days of the 80s and early 90s when there were so many of us that we really couldn't charge enough to be able to pay our employees because everybody else is just gonna undercharge you. 
where they get their employees is going to be interesting because there's no trained butchers out there. You have to create them for the most part. Do you provide uh, carcass data to, to uh, ranchers? I mean, that seems, maybe I don't understand things, but I, I can't, I don't, I call cows because either they jump fences, they run over me, or they're bad mamas, but I can't call cows on the quality of the, their, their meat because I don't know anything. Do you provide that information to these folks? We do for a fee. And that's, um, whether that's fair or not, um, I guess that it takes me time, or it takes one of my employees time to go into the cooler, collect that carcass data, um, and we're more than happy to provide it. It's just a fee, yeah. Um, going along that lines, uh, everybody's like, well, is it USDA choice? Is it USDA prime? My inspector and plant is not a certified grader. That's a different part of USDA. That's a per, uh, that's a service charge by USDA, not a grant um, given to you by law. So you have to pay for that. Um, USDA grades were created to create a system to fairly market cattle um, between the big plants and is it an indication of quality of meat. It's an indication of flavor. It's not an indication of tenderness. There is a slight, uh, there's a slight correlation if you look at the data between marbling and tenderness. But if we go out 21 days on aging, it doesn't matter. I can make something select about as tender as something that's average choice or high choice. Um, so yeah, carcass data. Carcass data is great. I think you should have it. I think you should call your animals on it um, because that's what the big, big, big boys are doing. Um, and they're selecting animals that way. Uh, I don't know what the latest data is, but I mean, there's an insane amount of cattle that grade USDA choice, right? We don't have a ton of cattle that grade select. Um, so we've done a pretty good job of a selection already. No, so my USDA inspector is not a part of the grading uh, chain. That's part of grading. Um, do you guys know what certified Angus beef is? It's 51% black hided. So it can be anything, right? That is, that is a marketing organization that owns no meat none whatsoever gets paid a lot of money to market certified angus beef that probably 50 percent of it isn't angus beef um they've done a great job absolute great job we have people that come in our shop is it certified angus beef no they like it to be because they've done a great job of marketing right and so that's where we all can do a great job of marketing and telling our story right does it need to be angus no, does Angus eat well? Yeah, so does Wagyu. But um, we mostly can't afford Wagyu. But we, we've slaughtered some Wagyu, and one of our customers that we do Wagyu for sells their meat for $18 an ounce. So it's pretty, uh, I tell my crew, do not screw this one up. <laughs> We will all go bankrupt over this animal. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's where the marketing comes in, right? They've done a great job. They took a nice, pretty black Angus cow, a beef animal, and they marketed on it. Done a fantastic job. Yep. Other questions? How do I ship it back? Most of our customers come and pick it up. Um, we don't really ship much. Um, our biggest customer has their own truck. They come and pick it up. We palletize everything for it. 
um, and we, they come and pick it up. They take it to their cold storage warehouse um, and store it. Along those lines, I'm not, I don't think we're there, um, but one of our customers has canceled a couple of their spots because they can't find buyers for their meat. And they have really good meat. Um, and so I don't know how much that direct marketing is getting saturated um, because of COVID, because everybody's like, oh, I'm gonna go buy a half a beef. And I told my wife this, I was scared. I said, COVID's gonna screw us. And she goes, what do you mean? I said, everybody's going and buying half a beef from every person they can find. The grocery stores are out of meat because they filled their freezers. You can't go to the store and find a freezer, a deep freeze, because they've all gone by, right? And so deep freezers are full. I think the next six months will be interesting. I don't know. We've seen a slowdown in January for sure. I anticipated that, but um, Christmas was fantastic. But. I had a question over here. No. Do you want to know why? Yes. We were great friends with China before the Trump administration. China and us do not get along. China tans virtually all the hides in the world. They ship from the United States, they go to China, they get tanned, they come back to the United States, get made into shoes and car seats. Okay? We piss China off. China has good relations with Australia and Brazil. They started buying their hides from Australia and Brazil. The other thing is, is we have these fantastic scientists that have created fake leather that is very, very good. And it is way cheaper to produce than real leather. So, yeah, fake meat too, yeah. Yeah, I, I encourage you, I'll tell you this, I encourage you, go to the store, buy it. Buy the fake meat. Take it home, cook it, and eat it. The biggest thing you can know about marketing and proving your product is better is knowing what the competition is doing, what it tastes like, right? One of our biggest customers the other day, she, she posted on Instagram that she got this package of fake meat that was shipped to them. And she, go, and she talked about how they were gonna throw it away. And I texted her and I'm like, you shouldn't throw it away. You should go cook it. Why would I do that? I'm not a vegetarian, I'm not a vegan. I said, yeah. But they're getting a lot of people to go eat their stuff. So you should go figure out what it tastes like so that you can explain the difference. Know what the competition's doing. Any other questions? Okay. Thanks for your guys' time. Please stop in and see us. Thanks, everybody, and uh, thanks for coming, and great Farm Ranch days. Thanks, Kelsey and McKenna. Uh, we'll see you guys next year.